Hi there and welcome to Hearthside. My name is Michelle and I am the author on this blog. Um, I'm just making accessible copies of all of my blog posts by making video formats of them. Um, hopefully I don't have any interruptions because I just got a new kitten on the weekend and they are wandering about so we will see how this goes. Um, so this particular post is about uh, Nerthus and Yord. Um, and something that I've been interested in recently is looking at Proto-Indo-European um, reconstructions of different deities and then sort of relating them back to heathenry and just seeing where that leads me. So, um, I think that if we're looking at the idea of an earth goddess, it's pretty easy to see the connections here between Nerthus especially and the Proto-Indo-European goddess, which they're reconstructing the name as sort of like Degum or something. I can't pronounce anything in Proto-Indo-European and honestly if anyone said that they could with much certainty then that would not seem likely to me. So um, that's the most common name that's used for the reconstruction, Degum, which means earth. And then there's another one, Plethwi, which is like broad one. Um, so pretty much any different um, version of polytheism historically had some sort of an earth goddess. So for heathenry it would have been Nerthus probably and then I think maybe later Yord, that's sort of my own speculation that Yord came later. Um, but definitely like we see it very prominently and it's brought up in modern paganism a lot as the idea of the earth goddess Gaia. Um, but it's almost every tradition has an earth goddess. Um, it seems to me that the intention during the Christianization of different regions was to erase goddesses in general um, and take away power from the women. And this we especially see happen in the Nordic region um, because the goddesses of the Nordic region seem to have quite a bit of agency and that's something that doesn't quite fit with the Christian worldview at that time. Um, probably still not today, but definitely not then. Um, so we see this when we're looking at the lore. Um, for example, a lot of the goddesses end up being labeled as Jotun. Um, that seems sort of like an attempt to demonize them or make them unworshipful. So, Skadi or Gerther, Rinder, all examples of this. Um, and we, it's interesting how in the lore, the Jotun men are not considered worshipful at all. But if the Jotun women um, join with a, a seer man, then suddenly they're part of the Aesir and they're goddesses and then they're worshipful. So it's this really bizarre thing going on there. Um, but the way I see it, the Jotun are a tribe and the Aesir are a tribe. And so really what's going on in the lore before it was written down by Christians is that um, it's showing that there's different tribes and someone who's not in your tribe could be kind of other, but they're still tribes that you're interacting with. Um, and so I think that 
the idea like of the marrying in in that sense makes sense that they join the tribe but I don't know if it it really makes sense that okay then they become goddesses like were they not goddesses before it's a tricky line because I'm not sure quite where I see that in my own practice um so then if we're looking at Yord then we're looking at this story that is about a sky god who has sex with an earth goddess and this story predates even the Nordic concept of othering um so then why is Yord a Jotun? Um, and in some cases it seems like even in modern heathenry we see Yord as a Jotun even when Skadi and Gerder at, seem to have their status raised. Now I think that most modern heathens consider Yord to be worshipful but a lot of them still sort of see her as a Jotun whereas with Skadi and Gerder it seems to be less the case in my experience. Um, so why is that? And I think that that's because um, even though we still see Yord as worshipful, something was going on with the Christian retellings of these stories. Um, in order to try to take away power from this particular goddess. Um, so Odin has sex with Yord, but Odin also has a wife, Frigg. And to me, the goddess Frigg fits more with the Christian narrative because here's a woman who on the surface seems like some sort of housewife, some sort of woman who might be obedient to her husband um and that's not really necessarily the case like Frigg is quite full of agency and quite often betters Odin in the sense of wit um but that's not what it is on the surface level so that was allowed to sort of stay in the lore when Yord was tried, they tried to take away her station in some sense. Um, and I think part of it was to do with her being this earth goddess because I think that prior to the time that Nordic heathenry first started, that in the Proto Indo European mindset, the earth goddess was quite powerful and I'm sure that um, extended into the heathen times pre-Christianity but probably the Christian church saw the earth goddess in general across cultures as dangerous to their mission and to spreading the word of their god. Um, so I think that's one thing that's going on here and I think the other thing that's going on is the Christian church was trying to promote this idea of monogamy and in doing so is trying to penalize Yord for not being the wife of Odin um, and saying that there cannot be more than one wife of Odin. Um, I don't know if Yord ever was a wife of Odin. I don't, I also don't really know if Frigg was ever the wife of Odin or if Odin just had a lot of lovers because I, he definitely did have a lot of lovers, but was there only one wife originally or did that change um, as the story was passed down through time and then finally recorded. Um, so I think 
that in modern heathenry, there's really no place to not be considering your a goddess um, because there's no reason to think that she's below Frigg in station in any way. Um, and that's something that we sort of need to get over from the overculture. Um, the idea that monogamy is the only acceptable way. Um, so then, if we're looking at Yord, there's this story about the sky god who has sex with the earth goddess, as I was mentioning. Um, but this story existed within the proto indopurian Indo-European uh, myth cycle already and different cultures has different names for the sky god or the earth goddess and the interesting thing is not only is it Yord and Odin but I don't think originally in the start of Nordic heathenry that it was a story about Yord and Odin because if you think about the original sky god who was in um, in Nordic heathenry, it wasn't Odin at all. It was actually Tyr. So then, was it Yord and Tyr who this story was about? And my argument is no, it wasn't even Yord and Tyr. I see it as, I think that the original earth goddess in heathenry was probably Nerthus, so it was probably Nerthus and Tyr who the story would have been about at the beginning of Nordic Heathenry. And then previous to Nordic Heathenry, it would have been Degum, the Proto-Indo-European. And then I cannot remember off the top of my head the name of um, the Sky Father from the Proto-Indo-European myth. Um, but this story predates all of our lore. And it still manages to play through all of it and be recorded. So it's quite fascinating to me. Um, and to me, like, Yord is the Earth Mother and she is a goddess who also predates heathen beliefs. By different names, and I would argue that it, Nerthus and Yord were at some point interchangeable. Now, in modern heathenry, I I see in my own practice them as separate but related deities. Um, but I think, like, if I'm thinking about it and like looking at what sources we have and looking at just what's going on. I I think it would have been Nerthus existed first and then slowly it switched to being Yord just as Tyr was the original sky god and then as Christianity came in it switched to being Odin because they could use Odin as this all-father figure that fits into the Christian worldview of having a singular deity. And that's really what they were pushing for at that point. So how soon Yord came into the picture, I'm not sure, but Odin, to me, came into the picture in this myth around the time of the Christianization, because that was the narrative that the church was using, was to have Odin as this supreme deity, so that when you move into their uh, their tradition and there's only one god, then it just, it fits a little bit nicer. Um, so the concept of Nerthus and Yord and what they stood for has changed over time, just as the concept of Tyr and Odin has also shifted. Um, but I would see 
Yord as the embodiment of woman is, womanhood itself, um, like a clay womb, a birth that birthed life into Myth Midgard. So, um, when the Sky Father and and the Earth Mother meet, then this is what this is. It's the creation of life on Midgard, and even before the concept of Midgard existed. It would have been the creation of life on the Earth. And, like, I know that there's our creation story about Ask and Embla, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, like, the birth of the trees, the birth of animals, etc., etc., which aren't really explained anywhere in the lore to any great detail. Like, this is what this event is. And it's not just limited to one moment in time either. It's a story that is cycles because the earth always comes alive again. Things are always changing. So Yord or Nerthus become the mother earth. Um, if we're looking at Bronze Age or even Stone Age women, then the idea of a curvy, fully formed woman was sensual because that was who would survive all the hardships of that time. And there would have been a greater respect for the creation of life and the birthing that women did. Um, so, we can't really strip away Yord's power, even in the modern context, because she already knows who she is. She is this full and vibrant woman who knows her own power. So what we're really stripping away is not the power of the Earth Goddess, but the power of womanhood. And I think that's very dangerous. That's a very big problem that we face with the patriarchy today. Uh, the disenfranchisement of women. And allowing people to, to dictate how we're viewed. So, all of this resulted from story that is very ancient and across many cultures being rewritten and making the female protagonist appear to be this promiscuous and dangerous mistress instead of a powerful woman. Um, so we need to learn something from this in modern heathenry, which is that women need to know that they should be comfortable in their own skins and that they shouldn't fear their bodies or be afraid of sexual pleasure. And definitely that women should not be meek or subservient to men. So this is exactly what we can learn from this story, even in the context that we find it in today. We can still see all these hints within the text and with reading between the lines what was intended by this story. So our, our Neolithic ancestors were not afraid to be themselves, and they had no reason to be. It wasn't something that in their society would have made any sense to them, and I think that they would be shocked if they walked into modern society and found all these strange ideas about how women should look and how women should act that they just don't make sense, really. And they also wouldn't have been worried about what kind of relationship 
Yord was having with the Sky Father, like even if it's Yord and Odin, and then there's Frigg, what difference does that make? As long as everyone is a consenting partner, it shouldn't matter. And it's really not something that we want to bring into our modern heathenry either, is the idea that relationships have to be the same way that the Christian overculture is trying to dictate. So that's something that we need to be cautious of as well. So I don't think that the existence of Yord negates the power of Frigg, nor does the existence of Frigg negate the power of Yord. They're two different and compatible forces. Um, and this is common in other mythologies as well, that there would be more than one partner in different relationships between deities. Um, so it's interesting how easily we can fit Frigg into the Christian rhetoric, but not so much Yord. And this is exactly the problem that we're having. And so we need to take a good long look at the story and at our modern heathenry and figure out how we can make them work with each other. We're in danger of getting too close to the mythology in the Christian context with Adam and Eve, where Eve is made of Adam's rib. And how can you even believe that to be true? That a woman is made out of a part of a man. It completely goes against nature to think that the man birthed the woman and not the opposite way around. So how exactly the church was able to pull this off and get so many people to agree with that story is really shocking to me. And beyond that, if we look at Adam and Eve, it just seems like Wait, wasn't there the story of Ash and Embla, who the Sky Father breathed life into? And those names, like, they start with the same letters, first of all. They sound kind of similar. But the Sky Father breathed life into them, into both of them, equally. And that at least makes sense as a story. And it just seems interesting that those were the names that were chosen almost to cover up the pre-existing story. But none of that negates the story of creation that is the Sky Father meeting with the Earth Mother and creating life. Because that pre-exists even the story of Ash and Embla. The story of Ash and Embla just explains how humanity came to be, but not how life came to be. And not that woman is a creative force, a force of transformation, and something that is powerful within nature and hard to deny. So when I think of Yord, I think of hills and valleys. 
of the curves of the earth itself. And when I think of Nerthus, I think of the underground caves and burrows and the wombs of the earth. So there's no doubt to me that the earth mother is female, a woman, the earth goddess, not the earth god. And that this is the power of creation and transformation that's tied to the earth herself. So we've known this since our prehistory and it seems a tragedy to me really that in recent centuries we've almost let ourselves forget it. And I think that that's really a problem with the narrative that we've been told because it's pulling us away from the earth and othering us from the earth. We're not othering Yord. We're being othered from Yord. And the problem with being othered from Yord is that we are not aware of our connection to the earth. And that allows us to do the things that we do that hurt her and hurt all of the plants and the animals and even ourselves. And on top of that, there's a bit of an argument to be made that if we're talking about the powerfulness of the earth, the mother earth, that it starts to sound almost like monotheism, but it isn't because even the narrative of the sky father and the earth mother, even a duality, that's too simple. That's just one goddess and one god. And that's just one story that explains one part of life in the nine worlds. It isn't just Yord or just Nerthus. And it isn't just Tyr or just Odin. And Frigg is not the same as Yord. They are completely different and have different roles. And their function in the lore is not the same. And they aren't just archetypes either. The archetypes are just silhouettes of the deities, the over oversimplification of what they are, because for us it's too hard to comprehend all of their vastness usually and so we create these boxes that we fit different deities in to better understand them at the level that we're at um, but that's not about them that's about us we have in heathen tradition living and breathing and evolving deities. Um, we have across all of humanity living and breathing and evolving deities. So Degum, the Earth Mother, who mates with the Sky Father, it slowly becomes Nerthus and Tyr, and then maybe later Yord and Odin. And then Yord is dismissed and replaced perhaps with Frigg. But then the meaning is starting to be lost of that story. So if we're trying to reconstruct a worldview from historical sources, it's difficult in modern heathenry because we have lots of sources, but they aren't all from the same time frame. And so that means that in order to reconstruct a practice that is livable, we're taking from all these different time frames and not everything's going to line up. So at some point, we need to interpret a bit for ourselves what is going to work in the modern context. So do we worship Yord or Nerthus or Degum or some combination of the three? 
Um, do we see them as separate deities, or do we use those names interchangeably? Um, I think that the most important part is that we need to recover the power of the Earth Goddess, um, and re-empower our heathen women, and we women in general. So, to me, like, I don't really feel a connection that far back as to Degum, for example. Um, that's too far back in the ancestral memory to be of much use to me, I think. But I see both Nerthus and Yord as worshipful in my own practice, and sometimes they could be interchangeable, but I see them as somewhat separate beings, um, with similar associations in some cases. So that's where I'm going with that, and I hope that it was interesting for you, and I don't know how familiar anyone who's watching this is with the Proto-Indo-European stories that are being reconstructed, and I'm going to be looking at a few more of them in the near future. So if that's something that might be interesting to you and help you to redefine a little bit of your practice, then that's wonderful, and um, I hope I see you next time.